Welcome once again. Uh, we've been doing a series on the shack for the last three weeks. This is week four of our series. And how many people have seen the movie at this point? I'd just like to show of hands. Not that many? Okay, we gotta start showing it more in here. So, uh, fr from this movie, there's a lot of debate out there on good, bad, uh, theological points, all right? We as a church, we always take the good and we throw out the bad. And so, let me just say, we are not universalists, everybody go to heaven. Uh, we do believe there's a way, you know, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father except through me. But there are points that you can learn from everything in life, right? And there's some great healing points from this movie. And if you've ever gone through pain, if you've ever gone through heartbreak, if you've ever lost someone close to you, and I speak from experience because the movie spoke to me as I lost my dad at 15 years old from cancer, and I remember that like it was yesterday. It was 20 years ago, but I can still remember it. And so this movie can definitely speak to your heart. It can speak to your anger, and it can help you to heal. And so I recommend it for anybody who's going through something or hurting or angry at God. This is a great movie, The Shack to See, because God can definitely help you through it. This morning what we're going to be doing is taking a certain principle from it, and we're going to be talking about the heart of a parent. How do I know the heart of a parent on, on Mother's Day? How do I know the, the heart of God and... Mackenzie in this movie is really, really struggling. He's really struggling as his little girl, as a father, got kidnapped, killed, buried in the woods. He didn't, wasn't able to find the body. They never discovered it until later on. And so he's called with a letter from God to go back to the place where this atrocity happened and he makes his way back to what they call the shack. The shack is where they found the little girl's dress spilled with blood. And here he is. The shack is transformed and he's before the Father, he's before the Son, and he's before the Holy Spirit, the Trinitarian God. And God is speaking to him. And he begins to wrestle with something because he's very angry at God. He's angry that God would allow this to happen. He's angry that God would allow something. If a caring God cared about him, how could he allow this to happen to him? But even more, if he was a loving God, how could he allow it to happen to the child that he was supposed to protect? And so Mackenzie has a lot of questions and a lot of issues. And he has a meeting with a lady. You could say probably the wisdom of a mother. And her name is Sophia, which means in the Greek, uh, the word wisdom. It means wisdom. Because the book of Proverbs, we see that there's two ladies. As Solomon wrote the book of Proverbs, he talks about two ladies. He talks about Lady Wisdom, which is the Holy Spirit, and Lady Folly, which is temptation. And temptation will always try to get the best of you. Temptation will always try to get you to enter into her house. She will try to lure you in because sin, we have to admit, sometimes is fun. But Lady Wisdom is there guiding us. Lady Wisdom is there calling us away from Lady Folly. Lady Wisdom is giving us discernment and instruction. And so there is Mackenzie standing before Lady Wisdom, and he has a question for her, and I just want to show you the clip so you understand where we're coming from this morning. Do you want me to say it? Absolutely. God is to blame. Well, if it's so easy for you to judge God, you must choose one of your children to spend eternity in heaven. The other will go to hell. That is ultimately the question that all of us have 
and all of us would be faced with if you had to decide which of your children would go to heaven and which one would go to hell would you be able to pick if you had more than one you see it's so easy to be able to judge God but to sit in the throne of God's seat we often don't understand it and so Mackenzie is faced with this dilemma where he has to choose one of his children and he can't do it and then she turns and tells him well neither can God God can't do it either and that's what we'll be going this morning in our passage but before Mackenzie got to that resolution in his mind he was so angry because it was easy for him to blame God. He says, absolutely, I blame God. And if you've ever been through a hurt in your life, you have to admit somewhere in the line, you have to ask God, why are you doing this to me? Why is this going on? And, and in doing that, sometimes we will pass blame on to God. Because blame is an easy thing to be able to go to. We don't ever want to look at our actions. We don't want to look at what we've done. And, and, but we want to blame somebody and sometimes we even blame ourselves for everything, and that's even wrong as well. It's just so easy to pass blame. You see, we live in a sinful place, in a sinful world, and sometimes things happen because it's not the way it's designed to be. It's not the way that God intended it. So you hear people often say this, well, God created me this way, so I must be this way. I, I must be perfect. No, I'm sorry. God did create you, but you have a taint of sin in you, and all of creation is fallen. Well, then why do people die? Because we're sinful, and the wages of sin is death. You see, God did create it wonderful and beautiful and created it great in the beginning. But ever since Adam and Eve, go to Genesis 3, and you will see Adam and Eve take a bite of the fruit, and when they chose to disobey God, what does the story say? Most of us know it, that they covered themselves from their nakedness because of their shame. Because of that guilt and shame, it caused them to not only divide from one another because a married couple, their nakedness showed that they had open emotional communication. It showed that they had open physical union. And yet when they covered themselves, they said, they're no longer am I going to open myself up to you. No longer am I going to express myself to you. No longer am I going to communicate to you. And they hid from God because they broke relationship with him and they broke relationship with each other. And then God calls in the distance and says, where are you? What have you done? And they both come out and they begin to blame one another. The, one, the man turns to the woman and says, I ate of the fruit that she gave me. Yet the man was the one that was given the commandment. The man was the one that should have known better. The man was the one that should have stood up and said this is wrong, but he's turning the blame to her because it's so easy to blame other people. The woman turns and blames Satan and says, it's Satan that lured me, it's Satan that tempted me, which is true, but nobody wants to take blame for themselves. That's the story we're going to be studying this morning in your Bibles. If you open up to John 8, we're going to a woman who was dragged at the feet of Jesus, and there's some blame going on. We're talking about a woman who is caught in adultery, who is caught in a sin, and we're going to see the blame game happen. And so if you open up your Bibles to John 8, we'll start in verse number 1, and we'll read through it just a little bit and jump through the section and dis dissect it. John 8, verse number 1. Some of your Bibles might have this. By the way, if you need a Bible, raise your hand. we got people over here that will pass them out to you. We want a Bible in your hand so you can actually read and follow along. We will have it on the screen. Some of you have it on your phones or your devices. Feel free to open those up. You can open up the Source Church app. It has the Bible on there, too. Just feel free to download that. So lots of different ways to get the Bible today. Rick's passing them out. Just raise your hand up there. In some of your Bibles, you'll see where it says the earliest manuscripts and many other ancient witnesses do not have John 7, 53 through 8, 11. You'll see that sometimes what happens is there's some contextual debate whether this story was in the original manuscripts. You see, they found manuscripts that some of the stories weren't in. There's different theories on that. One of the theories is, is because it was an act of adultery. 
By the way, adultery was a grievous sin that we'll point out in a minute. And because it was an act of adultery and people no longer wanted to really uh, uplift and uphold that act, and some of the people were falling into it in the church, and some people were looking like culture. It's, some people say that they actually took that out for a period of time. They took this story out. It's like they wanted to dissect the Bible and cut some pieces out, and then later on they put it back in because they said we shouldn't be really messing with God's word. You know, that's probably pretty bad if we do that. Uh, there, there's, there's people in history who have taken things and cut them out and, and just said, this is my Bible and this is what I'm going by. And, and, and that's not right because all of Scripture is God-breathed, it says. We shouldn't choose or pick or dissect what we want to follow and what we don't. You see, some people will just choose, oh, I'm just reading the New Testament. But then you're missing a whole bunch in the Old Testament because it's one God, one purpose with one Savior. Old Testament looks toward Christ. New Testament looks back to Christ. It's one God, one book. But people would often take things out. Other people say, well, it wasn't originally in. And, and so there, there's, you can read about that debate. There's some contextualization. But just for you to know, this story teaches a principle that we'll see all throughout the Bible. Since the beginning of time, people have been blaming one another when they make mistakes. Here is a girl and it says, they all went home. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him. And he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. Now that line is extremely important. They were using it as a trap. Why? Because if Jesus gave in and said, no, you don't have to stone her, he would be breaking Mosaic law. In fact, adultery was so big that God decided to put it in one of the Ten Commandments. Right? It was one of the very commandments that God wrote with his finger. Adultery, people would take somebody that was caught in adultery, and if you were a male, what they would do is they would take you, and they would bury you up to your knees in dung, and then they would take a towel and wrap it around your head and one person would pull on one side and another person would pull on the other side until you would suffocate. And then if your family cared about you enough, they would come and get you to give you a proper burial. If you were a woman caught in adultery, they would often drag you back to your father's house and they would stone you. They would stone you and leave you for dead. Why would they do it in front of the father's house? Because even if you were committing adultery in the act of um, where you were committed, such as Mary, Jesus' mother, was committed to Joseph. And so if you were engaged, they used to have a year-long engagement period where a man would go off and build the house and then come back and collect his wife. And so they would have a legal marriage in front of the family, but they would not consummate it physically. And then the man would go off and come back later, and if you were caught in adultery during that year period that you were betrothed, it was the father's responsibility to keep his daughter safe. It was his daughter's re father's responsibility to keep his daughter pure. And so they would drag the woman back to the father's house and stone her in front of the father and usually the brothers to make an statement. You see, adultery was a big sin. We don't see it as a sin today as much because, you know, we kind of live in the free sex type world. It's just a, an act of expression. There's no meaning behind it. We're just having fun. We're just having a good time. By the way, let me define the act of adultery. Act of adultery is any sexual activity outside the marriage. Marriage between a man and a woman, the Bible says, and anything out of it talks about sexual promiscuity, sexual sin, pornography, all of these things fall under adultery. In fact, Jesus expanded the act of adultery when he said on the Mount of Olives, when he was teaching the, or the Sermon on the Mount, when he was teaching in Matthew 5, he says, if anybody lusts 
after another individual in their heart, they're already committing adultery. It starts in the mind and goes through the act. You see, today we don't see it as that big a deal because we live in a different culture, a different time. But back then they saw it as a big deal. And God saw it as a big deal. And so if Jesus said, yes, I just forgive her and go along your way, he would have been breaking Mosaic law that said that she was to be stoned. But if Jesus said, go ahead and stone her, he would be breaking Roman law. Because Romans, who were the ones who were over the Jews at that time, the Jews were underneath the Romans. The Romans came in. That's why Pontius Pilate was governor of Rome in Jerusalem. And they had to go and get his permission in order to execute Jesus. The Romans were in charge. And they did not allow for Jewish execution without permission. And so they're taking this woman before Jesus. And if Jesus says, yes, go ahead and stone her, he would have been broken Roman law and he would have been executed. And so his ministry would have been done right off the bat. And so they're trying to set him up as a trap. They know this is a trap. Which, by the way, if they knew it was a trap, if they knew it was a setup, what did they do in order behind the scenes to be able to discover that this woman was caught in adultery? If they were setting it up as a trap, they had to have known about this woman. They had to have been known about this relationship. In fact, they were probably looking for this woman. They would probably study this woman. They had probably saw that she was pretty loose in all different types of relationships and that she was running around on her husband. And so they say, we're going to actually catch this woman in adultery. My theory is they probably hired on a male and they said, listen, we'll pay you some money. Go sleep with this woman. You can cheat on your wife. You can make some money out of it. And all the guys probably raised their hand and said, I volunteer, amen. <laughs> and so they're studying this woman. And as Jesus, they bring this woman to Jesus. And they say, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. What does Jesus do? You see, it's so easy to blame other people. Jesus gets down on his hands and his knees and begins to write in the ground. I mean, that's what it says. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them. And, and I love the patience that Jesus shows. He just, he just gets down and begins to scribble. Now, what did Jesus scribble? We don't honestly know. There's speculation on it. But I believe that Jesus, being God, probably did the same thing that God did with the Ten Commandments. What did God do with the Ten Commandments? How did he write them? He wrote them with his finger on a tablet. Jesus gets down and begins to scribe out with his finger on the ground. Now, did Jesus outline all Ten Commandments? I don't know. Maybe Jesus just outlined this one. It's sinful for another man to covet another man's wife. It's sinful for the act to commit adultery. You see, what would happen is, as he's scribbling this out, each person would have been able to see what Jesus is writing and realizing in their minds in that moment that they had actually committed a sin as well. Because in order to sabotage Jesus, they would have had to do what? They would have had to study. And so they would have gone to this woman's house and watched her in the act of having sex with another person in order to storm into the house to drag her out. And you're telling me that you're studying her having sex with somebody else? You're studying them and you're not committing adultery in your own heart? You're telling me that you can watch two other people doing stuff and it not covet your eyes, it not give you lustful thoughts? You see, it all starts. And so as Jesus is scribbling this out, Jesus knew their hearts. Jesus knew their minds. And them being sinful themselves, committing a sin to catch Jesus, to catch this woman in the act, to set him up. They drag this woman before Jesus. And Jesus begins to start to say, well, are you so pure here? I mean, there's other places in the Bible that it talks about that as well. Jesus says, why are you going to pick out the speck of your brother's eye when you have a log in your own? 
You see, it says, do not judge one another. That, that, Jesus isn't saying that we shouldn't judge. Because the truth is, God judges salvation, but we judge by the fruit. We judge people on what they're doing. If we could never judge, because you hear people say that, right? Well, God says, you can't judge me. Well, the truth is, if that was true, then we would never be able to come along our brother and sister in Christ and say, there's some things in your life that I'm seeing that aren't good here. And I'm just calling you to account because I care for you and love you. You say, don't judge me. You don't understand. I'm not judging you. But there's things in this Bible that are wrong. And I'm trying to point this out to you because I care and I love and I want the best for you. And so people all the time will say, you can't judge. But, but God says we need to judge by the fruit. We need to study. The problem is we often want to judge the outsiders. We want to judge the non-Christians. You see, God never called us to judge the world. That's his job. God called us to judge the insiders. God called us to judge the Christians among us. That's discipleship. That's discipline. That's walking beside one another in love when he says, confess your sins to one another. It's not in order for someone to beat you up or to gossip about you. It's for someone to be able to walk beside you. It's for someone to be able to give you accountability. It's for someone to show you grace. It's for someone to help you grow. That's the purpose of it. And so, so often people will say, don't judge me because they just want to continue doing whatever they're doing. But God shows grace. Jesus shows grace. And he shows grace to this woman. So I want to talk to you about my very first point, beyond blame. If we can get beyond blame. Because what's happening is the people are blaming this woman. By the way, where is the man in the story? Where's the man? You see, they're trying to blame and put everything on this woman. But you're telling me the man isn't at fault? You're telling me the man isn't being dragged and, and being suffocated and, and going through. And so they're trying to set up Jesus. And they're trying to set up this woman. And they're pointing blame within their own hearts. They hate Jesus so bad. In their own hearts, they're lusting and coveting. And yet it's so easy to look at the sin of her instead of themselves. Isn't that what we do when we blame one another? In our relationships, in our marriages, in our family. You see, I tell people, all right, admit to your blame, but there are other persons to blame. It was my boss. It was my coworker. I said, yes, maybe they're at 99%. Do you have 1% of responsibility that you can own up to and claim and say you're sorry for? Even if it's 1%, yes, they're at 99. But in order for people to fight, it takes two. And it's so easy to pass blame. But it's not till we get beyond blame that we can experience the grace, that we can find freedom, that we can find healing, and we can actually sit down and have real conversations with one another when we're not yelling and screaming and blaming because blame turns to anger and anger that's not dealt with turns to bitterness and bitterness turns to spite and then it just turns to grudges and it begins to harden our hearts. It allows Honestly, Satan and the demons to oppress us because that's the one thing that they cannot do is forgive. And so unforgiveness they use as a doorway into our life and to be able to oppress us. <laughs> Jesus finds a loophole. I love that. Jesus finds a loophole. He bends down with his finger. He writes in the ground. And this is what he says. All right, I'm not going to go Mosaic. I'm not going to go Roman. You guys do what you want to do. By the way, why are they bringing this woman to Jesus? Because they really should have been bringing her to the high priest. They really should have been bringing her to the priest. You don't bring somebody caught in adultery to a rabbi or to a teacher. You don't do that. But they bring her to Jesus because they're trying to set him up. But Jesus, just so smart, says, here's what he says. Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. You see, Jesus just gives a small bit of advice and says, then go do what you want, and begins to write on the ground. And as he's writing out, maybe he's writing out the sins of each individual there. And one by one, they begin to leave from the oldest, because maybe the oldest realizes 
that they're sinners most, all the way to the youngest, who is probably the most prideful. And they begin to drop their stones and leave. And then Jesus turns to her, and I love this part, and he says, has anyone condemned you? You see, the only one who was able to condemn, the only one who was able to actually stone her or to cast a stone was Jesus. And yet Jesus, as they're left alone, Jesus decides to show her grace. Second point I want to talk to you is how grace comes from love. Grace comes from love. It's only when we'll be able to get beyond the blame that we can experience grace. And the grace comes from love. It's when you're able as a parent, and you know this for some of the moms in here on Mother's Day, you're able to look past some of your child's sins. You're able to look past some of the things that they have done because you're able to remember that little boy or that little girl that you nurtured, that you cared for, that you love so tenderly. You see the person and not the sin. You see the person and not the act. That's what Jesus does. He doesn't remove that she's a sinner. She doesn't, he doesn't sit there and say, you know what, it's okay, just go off and commit some more adultery. No. Jesus being the only one that can choose to cast the first stone, decides to let it go. He doesn't just let it go and say, continue to live your life. What does he do? What does he do? He says, woman, has anyone condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Neither, then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Now go and leave your life of sin. You see, Jesus, the only one that was able to condemn had the Father's heart where he cared and he loved for her so much, and he says, I'm not going to sit here and throw stones at her. I'm not going to condemn her. I'm not going to beat her up. No, what I'm going to do is I'm going to step in her place. Just as we saw in the video that Mackenzie could not choose which child to put in hell and which child to put in heaven. Mackenzie couldn't choose which child to save and which child. And so Jesus says the same thing. I'm not going to choose between this person's sins. I'm not going to choose between your sins. I'm not going to choose between your sins. I'm not going to say, oh, because you're an adulterer, you have higher sins. Oh, but you committed theft, you have higher sins. Oh, because you have a, a hard heart and a hard heart with vengeance in it. I'm judging your sins. What about some of the things that we're called to do that we don't do when we're supposed to love one another or good gifts or, or actually hand out a bum on the street and we just pass them by and we don't really care at that moment. And Jesus doesn't say, oh, I'm going to judge that sin more than else. What he says is, I'm going to come down. I'm going to pay the price because I am the only one that can pay the price for her. I'm the one that can condemn her, but instead I'm going to pay the price. The reason he didn't stone her, the reason Jesus didn't allow them to be stoned is because he knew that he was going to be stoned. He showed her grace. The grace was paid in advance. He said, go ahead and be forgiven because I'm going to stand in your place. You see, the Bible tells us the wages of sin is death. And God doesn't just say, go ahead and have a free pass. Go on your merry way. Instead, somebody has to pay the price. But because God doesn't want to choose between you or me, he says, I'm going to pay the price for her. Amen? amen. God chose, amen. God chose to be stoned so she didn't have to. And God chose to die on the cross so you don't have to. God chose to stand in your place. That's what we call substitutionary atonement. He went to the cross, and he went to the cross because of what I've done. He's went to the cross because of what you've done. He went to the cross because you've chosen somewhere in your life to commit adultery on God. Because adultery, the Bible says, is that God married the church, and the church is the bride of Christ, and God is the groom. And yet we have decided to betray, to follow other idols, to betray our groom and to run around and to do our own thing and to run and flee. And yet God still chose to show love. God stood in the place on the cross for her 
So she did not have to be stoned. You see, it was grace. And from grace comes love. And then from love, we can actually find the heart of a parent. I want to talk to you, my third point, the heart of the God. And you know, so many times we refer to God as a father, but here I just want to say the heart of a parent because mothers and fathers have hearts for their children. And they need to show them and, and teach them. And it's just as Jesus straightened up and asked her, and he said, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you. Jesus declared, Go now and leave your life of sin. Jesus held her accountable for her sin. He didn't just dismiss it. He said, You're still a sinner. You're still an adulteress. You've still done this. But quit it. Go and leave that life. Go and experience freedom. I've shown you grace. I've shown you love. Now you have a second chance. You have a second opportunity. I stood in your place so you didn't have to. And it's from that love and grace that transformation happens. It's from that love and grace that she learns to follow Jesus. It's not through him beating her up and, and beating her down. Because you know what? So many people had done that in her life. She was used by those individuals to set up Jesus. She was used by that man that she fell into adultery with. She was being used and abused as a woman. And Jesus is the first man and first individual that shows compassion and real love to her. She was looking for love in all the wrong places. She was looking for love from individuals where she was running around from person to person where they could easily spot, oh, we could target her. She could be an easy setup for us. We'll trap Jesus with her. And so she was looking for affirmation. She was looking for kindness. She was looking for love. And yet Jesus, as the first individual who stood there and loved her and gave her words of encouragement. I heard of a pastor this last week who was talking about an airplane ride that he was on with a young lady and the young lady was traveling to the dorm room to live with her boyfriend. And she was moving from one state to another. And the pastor was asking her all these questions on the plane as he sat next to her. And never told her he was a pastor till later on. And, and she's talking about how, oh, you know, we're going to have this great relationship. We're going to have this great time. And, and he says, well, what's your plans? What's your mission? What's your vision in life? And I don't know, but I'm just going to be happy with him. Well, is he planning on marrying you? I don't know. We're just living and going one day at a time right now. We're just going to live together. Well, is how do your father feel about this? Well, I'm old enough to make my own choices. He's out of the picture. I really don't care what he thinks. I'm, I'm a grown-up now. And his pastor was talking about how he was just breaking his heart as a dad because he wanted to stand up for this girl. In fact, when they got off the plane... She's standing there, and he says, do you need my phone to call him? And she said, no, I'm taking a cab. Well, why? Because he's not willing to pick me up. He's busy, you know, so I'm going to take a cab. And he's like, man, this individual, if I was your dad, I would kill him. And I would be doing prison ministry from the inside. <laughs> because she's looking for this love, and what this guy's going to do is just use an abuser because he doesn't even care enough to pick her up at the airport. He doesn't even care enough to drive over there. He's not looking for relationship. He's not looking for covenant. He's not looking for commitment. He's not looking for marriage, and she's going to just cook for him while he does his studying and clean for him until he finds somebody better, and then she's going to be tossed aside. This was the woman at Jesus' feet. And this is the woman and children and girls and young girls today who are out there who are experiencing life and they're looking for someone who just cares and loves them enough. And Jesus is standing there saying, I love you. I care for you. I stood in your place so you did not have to go to that cross. I substituted my body, my flesh, my blood was spilt for you. And that's love and grace when we're willing to sacrifice for one another. That's true love, and that's what we should look for in relationship. And God the Father says, I love you that much that I can't judge you. I'm going to judge you by putting the punishment of death on myself so you can live. Amen? Amen. One final point. One final point I want to make to you. 
as, as Jesus says, go, live your life. Jesus, in order to connect with the parent's heart, substitutes himself kind of like this. There was a young man who continued to come home late. And his parents are sitting there at the dinner table and the dad looks up and says, you know, your mom cooks this meal for us every single night. You know what time you're supposed to be home. You continue to come home late. Young man says, yes, I know eats his plate of food and, and leaves. Next day, he comes home late again. Dad looks at him and says, listen, if you come home late one more time, there will be no meat for, meal for you. If you come home late one more time, we're just gonna eat without you between because we're tired of waiting for you. We've told you the rules, you're not listening. Young man says, okay, leaves next night, comes home late again. That night, there's only two plates set. That night, there's only two meals on the plates, and they're sitting there. And he comes in and sits down, looks around, and there's no meal for him. And when he understood grace, and it's Mother's Day, so I'm going to say the mom did this and not the dad, but the mom looked at him and said, here. And she passed her meal over to him. You see, somebody had to sacrifice. Somebody had to be obedient. Jesus cannot say, oh, sin is just fully forgiven, just go, because the payment has to be paid in order for us to worship a righteous God. He's just, and he has to do what he says, and if he says the wages of sin is death, then it's death. But the difference is, just as that mom sacrificed her meal for the love of her boy, and he looked at his mom starving there, not eating, giving up her dinner so he can partake, is the same invitation that Jesus gives to all of us. He says, woman, go and sin no more. Break this lifestyle of sin. Break this lifestyle of adultery. Break this lifestyle that you're living and come with me. I'm sacrificing to show you love. Now experience the freedom behind it. It's the same invitation that Jesus gives each of us. And so I don't know what sin you've committed. I don't know what sin is hanging over your head. I don't know what's weighing you down this, this, this morning. Maybe it's even... Some of us probably in this room have even probably committed adultery sometime and we have guilt or shame in our hearts. Or maybe it's we've lusted in our hearts. Maybe some of us are, let our minds go to even pornography and chased after things and breaking that covenant relationship. Maybe some people have hurt others and, and cheated and stolen. I don't know what it is. Maybe there's some unforgiveness in your heart that you need to extend to somebody. Whatever it is this morning, Jesus is offering you an invitation that he's paid the price on the cross. Now go forward from here and sin no more. Receive his forgiveness. Receive his grace. Receive his open invitation of love where he says, here, you experience life and not life that wants to contain you or trap you, but life in abundance. And you experience because I'm sacrificing myself. And I'm going to go to prayer right now. And if there's something that you need prayer for, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have the prayer team, all right, over here to the left and over here to the right. And you feel free to come down and get prayed over this morning. You feel free to come and, and just have someone pray over your life. And maybe it's you just need help with finding some forgiveness in your life. Maybe you need to receive Jesus for the very first time because you've been walking with this rules and walking with this regulation and walking by the rules of, of, of religion and you've never experienced true relationship. Maybe you've bounced from church to church and from person to person and Bible study to Bible study, but you've never really felt the presence of God or Jesus or his love. And you just need to receive Jesus for the first time. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus rose from the dead because he didn't just die, he rose from the dead, that you too will be saved. You see, he gives us that gift. He gives us that open ticked invitation. And if there's a sin in your life, past, present, or future, Jesus paid for it on the cross. He paid for your sin. And if you need prayer to find freedom, if you need prayer to find forgiveness, if you need prayer in your life, I'm going to pray for you now. But as we play this last song, if you need to come forward this morning and have the prayer team just pray over you, lay hands on you, pray with whatever you're struggling with, they want to do that.
and then we'll bless you as we go from here. So will you bow your heads with me? Father God, we come before you this morning. And I pray that if anybody needs prayer this morning, they're able to receive. If someone needs prayer this morning, they're able to come forward and, and receive this freedom that you offer to all of us. Just as you forgave this woman, your heart is to forgive us. To understand the heart of a parent is to understand that you see us as your children. You care for us. You love us. You, you desire to spend time with us. You wait for us to come to you and speak to you in prayer. To read the Bible where we can have you speak to our hearts. It's like sitting down with our parent over a cup of coffee. It's like sitting down with a relative. So Father, I pray this morning that people are able to find grace. People are able to find freedom. People are able to experience your love in a new way. People, if they've been jumping from relationship to relationship, looking for love in all the wrong places, Lord, I pray they're able to realize right now that you love them and care for them and you want to speak to them and speak to their heart. And just as you send this woman away and say, go sin no more, live a life of sin, uh, live a life without sin, live a life of freedom. Father, I pray that we can experience the same freedom in our life freedoms that you want to set us free through the Holy Spirit. You want to set us free to experience not the containment or the trapment of sin, but to be able to overcome it, to be able to be an example, and to be able to produce a testimony. So Father, I pray this morning that we come before you, and we bow down at your altar, we bow down at your feet, and we receive freedom and forgiveness. In Jesus' name we pray.